this morning none other than the right Reverend Gary Kelly. Hear him as God preached through him. Tell your neighbor we're going to hear some preaching here today. Morning, Pleasant Grove. First, I would like to thank God for giving me this preach opportunity. And I also want to thank my pastor for his guidance, for his correction. I really appreciate it. And I would like to thank my preach brethren for all their support, their encouraging words. All the other officers of the church and you, the church body, thank you. We have a word today that's going to come from the 15th chapter of John, verse 26 and 27, and you can remain seated. It says, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And ye also shall bear witness because ye have been with me from the beginning. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Holy and gracious Father, we come once again just thanking you for another opportunity to be in the house of the Lord. We come now acknowledging your power and your glory in our lives. We come now just thanking you, dear Heavenly Father, for this day. I thank you for this preach opportunity, Father. I ask, dear Heavenly Father, that you touch me in my spirit, dear Heavenly Father. Allow me to Said the words that are pleasing in your sight. Lift me up, dear Heavenly Father, so that that word, dear Heavenly Father, that's in me, dear Heavenly Father, that come flowing out. I just thank you, God, for all that you do for me. For you keep me, dear Heavenly Father, when I couldn't keep myself. Keep myself. I just thank you, God, for all that you do. I ask, dear Heavenly Father, that you decrease gear, dear Heavenly Father, that you may be lifted up. I just ask, dear Heavenly Father, that you touch the hearts and minds of those that are here today in every church that is open in your name. I just thank you for all that you do. These are so many other blessings I ask in your darling son, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to start off by telling a little story. It goes like this. It says a trucker used to amuse himself by running over lawyers he would see walking on the side of the road. Every time he would see a lawyer walking down the street, he'll swerve and hit him. After hearing a loud thud, he'll swerve right back onto the road as if nothing happened. But one day, the truck driver was driving alone and he saw a priest hitchhiking. So he stopped and he asked, where are you going, Father? The, preacher, the priest replied, five miles down the road to the church. No problem, says the trucker. Climb on in, I'll give you a lift. So the happy priest climbs into the passenger seat of the truck and the truck driver continued driving down the road. Suddenly he spotted a lawyer walking on the side of the road and instinctively he swerved to hit him. But then at the last minute he remembered there's a priest in the truck with him. So he swerved and missed him. But he still heard a loud thud. Not understanding where the noise came from, he glances in his mirrors, but he doesn't see anything. So he turns to the priest and he says, forgive me, Father. I guess I must have hit that lawyer. You missed him, replied the priest, but that's okay. I got him with the door. <laughs> Lawyers have long had the reputation of being some of the shadiest people you could ever deal with. And I'm quite sure that's not all lawyers, you know, you have your good and you have your bad and everything. But what, have I, what I have learned from watching the first 48, if you get yourself in trouble, you might need to get you a good one. But today in my sermon, I want to talk about that good lawyer, that advocate, Jesus Christ, the one that we can call on in times of trouble. When I look at, my, when you look at, look at this, uh, the chapters preceding my text, in chapter 13, 14, and 15, this is Jesus Christ. He's, he's told the disciples that, you know, his time is, is come near and, you know, he's going to have to lead them. He's told Judas, 
you know, you can go because I know what you're going to do. He's told Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And the disciples, you know, they're sad right now. They're probably afraid, not really knowing what's going to happen in the future. So Jesus in chapters 14, 14 and 15 gives so many encouraging words to help them deal with, what, with what's going to come. And we can use those same scriptures to encourage ourselves and others when times seem to be rough. I wrote down a few of them that kind of just give you a gist of how much Jesus was thinking about his disciples during this time. And like I said, we can use these same scriptures when we're going through the things that we may be dealing with in life. It says that, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe in me also. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, ye may be also. I will, need, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. All these scriptures and many more in chapter 14 and 15 were to comfort and, cut and encourage the disciples during this troubling time. In my text, like I said, Jesus has just revealed that, you know, his, his time is coming near. And, and at one point, you know, all the focus of the hate was right toward Jesus. But pretty soon, it was going to be on the disciples. And they're going to need to know how to deal with this situation. So in the scripture, Jesus is letting them know, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send you a comforter. And that comforter resides in each and every one of us that, who has given our life to Christ. And, you know, I, I, I love to watch, you know, um, you know, shows about law. I like Law and Order. I like all the judge shows. I like suits. That's a great suit. I, I believe Pastor probably love that if you ever watch it because they have the nicest suits I ever seen. <laughs> but 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 in those in those shows, it's a thing that that the prosecutors and the police really never like to hear a suspect say. I'm not saying anything until I speak to my attorney. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I watched the first 48 and, and time and time again, I was like, why in the world he won't ask for a lawyer? Clearly he's bright as a brick, then got himself in a whole lot of trouble, and yet still he think he can talk himself out of the situation on his own. And then I thought about it, you know what? I'm that way a lot. And I'm quite sure if you examine your own self, you can say, you know what? I'm that way a lot of ways too. You know, I don't go to God when I'm supposed to. I don't call on that that counselor, that advocate, that lawyer that will speak up for me. Sometimes I just go on, you know, I'm going to handle it myself. I got this. I got this. And then when the outcome is messed up, then we want to call it. And now he's got to go and straighten out what we messed up. But what I love about Jesus is he's telling us, listen, I'm never going to leave you. It's up to you to remember that. And like I said, life comes at you real fast, real hard. But what I'm telling you now, when situation arise in your life, don't go and call Alex Shannar and what's the other guy that got the big check and all them other folks. You might want to call on Jesus. Because through Jesus, as my subject says, you are all lawyered up. The disciples are going to be persecuted for, for Christ's sake. They will be accused of breaking the law just like Jesus did. We must understand we've, if you are given life, if you've, if you've given your life to Christ, you will be put on trial daily. The world wants to see how you respond. So when the world accuses you, invoke your right to counsel. That means talk to Jesus before you make a decision. And I'm quite sure, you know, it's easy to say but when you're faced with things daily, it seems like it's automatic. We, we automatically react. You know, I was raised a certain type of way. You know, my dad had told me, you, you better fight. So sometimes it might, you know, automatically just come out. 
But what I've learned is if I just say, Gary, you know what? Usually your first thought is the wrong thought. Especially in certain situations, what would Jesus do? How would Jesus handle that situation? And, and I, from doing that, I've learned I still make mistakes, but I have to think about, you know, even if a person treats me bad or service may not be good where I'm at, what would Christ say and do in this situation? I guarantee you, when you say something positive or you do something positive, that positive seems like it comes back to you. And like I, I've said it a thousand times, I told my you McDonald's example all the time, they, they dog the McDonald's out in Woodlawn. And they do, they get new people all the time. And you kind of got to get, they get used to it. And, and, and my wife can attest to it. Once they know who I am, and I'm quite sure their attitude is bad, I say about two or three words. And they be like, oh, come on around. Come on around. Now, they may be getting bad service to other folks. But once you give them that positive word, you keep that smile on your face. And even if they make a mistake, you don't beat them down for it. Some kind of way, they just seem to remember you. And their, their face light up when they see you. And, and, and that's the way we have to do. We have to call on God. We have to let Jesus Christ be the one that, that, that lead us and guide us. So we have to be careful. We don't just want to jump out there. We want to make sure that we are, we are being led by God. Jesus explains to the disciples, it is me the world hate. So, the world, if, so if the world sees Christ in me, the hate is automatically going to come. In verse 26a of the text, Jesus says, but when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father. Jesus has not left you without comfort. The comforter will be there to help, to help you defend yourself. So when the attack comes, it's no doubt the attack, the attack is going to come. The comforter is there. So don't lose your mind. Always remember, I'm all lawyered up. Because I'm telling you, if you forget that the comforter is there, you're going you're gonna to operate in your own might. And I guarantee you, the outcome is going to be bad. So what I've learned to do is say, Gary, listen here. You can see things with these physical eyes and mess it up. Or you can say, you know what? I'm a child of God. Persecution coming is part of who I am. So when it comes, don't lose your mind. Don't make no crazy mistake. Say, you know what? This got to be a test. It's got to be tests. I love games, and I love to win. I like to play. I, I, like, I like to figure stuff out. I like puzzles. I like all that. I don't want to do the same thing over and over and over again. And if you're not careful, you'll live your life making those same mistakes over and over and over again. And you'll blame everybody. You'll blame your spouse. You'll blame your job, you'll blame your children, you'll blame your money, you'll blame the government, but the common denominator is you. So when you keep finding yourself in these situations, eventually you gotta say, this might be a test. This might be me needing to do something that God wants me to do. That thing that is gonna please him, and I guarantee you, you won't have to keep taking that test. But yes, another test is gonna come, but you won't be taking the same test and you'll begin to grow. So remember, the first thing you want to do, you want to call on Jesus. In the movie, after someone gets arrested, the offer informs the sus suspect you have one phone call. So the question is, who you going to call? <laughs> Back in 2008, Kanye West spent one day in jail for destroying a paparazzi's camera. He was arrested, and when given the opportunity to use a phone, use a phone, he called Mr. Childs and ordered Chinese food. I wouldn't advise you to do that, but I would advise you to call on Jesus Christ. As your attorney, he's always looking out for your best interests. In John 14 and 16, the chapter preceding my, my text, it says, Jesus tells his disciples, I will pray the Father and he will give you a comforter and he may, and he may, that he may abide with you forever. So this confidence is not coming and going. He's there. Jesus has prayed for him to come because he knows you're going to need him. Now Jesus has been here on earth and he knows exactly what you're dealing with. I don't care what you've dealt with. Jesus has not committed a sin, but I guarantee you he has seen, he's touched the heart of 
someone that's dealt with anything that you've dealt with. He know exactly what you're going through. So you want to call on him when you're dealing with these situations in life. So you want to make sure that you don't forget. He's with me and he's with me forever. And I guarantee you when you start thinking along those lines all the time, what's going to happen is you're going to stop doing some of the stuff you do. Because you're going to get convicted. You're be like, you know what? Jesus is with me. I, I joke with the guys all the time. I said, when you go somewhere, I said, think about it like this. Would I go here if Jesus was right here beside me? And I guarantee you, if he was right there in the physical, you wouldn't go. You wouldn't say what you say. You wouldn't do what you're doing. So that tells me that if he's in me, he's just like he's beside me. Like Pastor said earlier, he's before you and he's behind you because he's in you. So you have to know that and say, you know what, I can't just go and do what I want to do because there are so many things that can happen by being disobedient to the word of God. So remember, call Jesus. But you also got to trust Jesus. And I, I mess with the guys at the shop all the time. I said, you know, trusting to men is kind of hard. So you kind of got to practice it a little bit. So this is a good thing to do, to practice being more trusting. Let your wife drive your car. Get in the passenger seat. And if she hit a pothole, don't say nothing. If she's swerving all over the road, don't say nothing. <laughs> if she seems like she's speeding, don't say nothing. Matter of fact, just go on and nod off. Trust God that you're going to make it home safe. It's not like she's having a wreck every day. <laughs> but we have to learn to trust Jesus. We got to trust Jesus. And that comes through practice. And I tell guys, I said, listen, I said, you can say what you want to say. If you keep suffering the same thing over and over and over again, I said, I can test to it. You, you're not trusting Jesus. I remember I was talking to a pastor about a situation, and I was talking about someone else. And he kept saying, I didn't get it. He said, so you don't trust Jesus. He wasn't even, he, talk, he wouldn't even talk about the person I was talking about. He was like, no, you ain't trusting Jesus. And I guarantee you, if you look at it and you examine your situation that you're dealing with, it's going to come to you ain't trusting Jesus. Because Jesus can handle any situation that you're dealing with. He got the answer to any problem that you have. So you can keep blaming whoever you want to blame, but the one that is in total control is God. And I guarantee you, Jesus is the answer to that problem. So always remember, you all lawyered up. Trusting Jesus is the only way believers can fight off the haters of this world. If we ever hope to testify effectively we must speak the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth it's a thing they have it is called the clean hand doctrine it says that if you go into court trying to get equity from the court that your hands have to be totally clean in the matter so you can't go to court and say you know what so and so stole my TV but the TV was already hot So when you go and you want to tell God, you know what, so-and-so did me this way. And they did me this way. You can't have dirty hands in that situation because God said, yeah, and you did them this way. So what, what you want to do is, is if a situation arises in your life, something's going on, you want to do that thing that's going to be pleasing to God. And it's got to be pleasing to God from the beginning to the end. And I know it's hard because, you know, we, we, we in this body, we're in this physical body, and, and we're going to make mistakes. But I know this much. If you do those things that are pleasing to God, I guarantee you the outcome is going to be better. It may not be the outcome exactly that you want, but it's going to be the outcome that God needs for that situation. And, and, and that's what it's all about because, like we say all the time, it's your will, God, not my will. You can say it, but do you believe it? Because if you believe it, guess what you're going to say? I'm not going to fly off the handle just because God, God wants me to handle this a certain type of way. Because like I told him, I said, listen, we are all here together for a reason. We can encourage each other or we can wind up hurting each other. Why not do something that's going to lift someone's spirit or help someone then hurt them? So we can get caught up in ourselves and say, you know what? They did me wrong and they did. But guess what? God still got me anyway. But I know 
even when people do me wrong, God always does me right. And even if they do me wrong, God makes it all right with the way he feels and treats me. So I say, you know what, I'm going to keep pushing on. I'm going to keep pushing on. And I guarantee you, once you do that, that person that used to bother you all the time, it just seems like they don't want to bother you no more. And yeah, and if they do, you're going to just smile and say, you know what, it is what it is. But we have to remember that, listen, that we are all lawyered up. We don't have to continue to fight and struggle. The truth has a strange way of revealing itself. Jesus tells us that even the spirit of truth was proceeded from the Father. The spirit of truth proceeded from the Father. I didn't make the truth. You didn't make the truth. God said what was the truth. So I need to say what God said. And what I've learned is when you try to fight against the truth, oh, you got a battle on your hand. You got a battle on your hand. And it's something that... I, I'm talking, I love Judge Judy. Judge Judy said this all the time. When you're telling a lie, you got to prop it up with a lie. And then you got to remember all the lies that are attached to it. But when you tell the truth, it seems like everything kind of go together. You don't even have to have a good memory when you tell the truth. But I guarantee you, when you tell a lie, that's why you be talking to your children, you be sitting there, and the more they talk, your head start turning, twisting. What do you? Because you know when they lie. But guess what? God treats us the same way. Like, I know you're lying. Well, I knew you were going to lie a thousand years ago. <laughs> you're going to lie. So we have to say that, listen, that, 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 that I need to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in the situations I'm dealing with in my life. That means that you got to talk to people about the issues that they're dealing with. You can't just tell folks anything. You can't tell them anything. You can't tell them, go and knock their heads off. I hear people all the time and giving advice about situations they only hear one side of the story. I said, you better stop doing that. I said, you only heard one side of that story. You gave an opinion. We was in the shop. The guy just telling him what the guy, what he need to do. I said, first of all, you hadn't heard his wife's side of that story. And I advise you not to give him, him any more advice as if you know everything that went on. If you can't say something that's going to help both of them, you need to be quiet. Because, because the truth, it's about the truth. It's not about you. It's not about our emotions. It's about the truth. We're all lawyered up through the truth. The truth, according to the word of God, is proof of our innocence. Christ's blood makes us innocent. His blood makes us innocent. Nothing we did, nothing we deserve, is just simply him, us accepting him that has made us justified. So we're innocent through the blood of Christ. So how do we expect to treat people in any kind of way and then still remain innocent? I'm about, how, how do we think that we're going to just treat people in any kind of way and remain innocent? What I learned is we got this physical body. Yeah, yeah. And the physical body can be fine. I'm going to imagine seem, seemingly to be fine. But we have a spiritual body also. We have a spirit that dwells within us. We can't do anything and then think our spirit going to be all right because folks, they'll try to convince you, oh yeah, everything good in my life. You know they cheating, you know they stealing, you know they lying, you know they acting crazy. And you say, no, it's no way possible. I said, because my innocence, my righteousness has to be, I have to work through that in order for me to be okay on the inside. I'm more concerned about being okay on the inside. So when I that makes me say, you know what, Gary, you can say something about it, but is it going to be something that's going to please God? Or you can just keep your mouth closed and you're going to be all right on the inside. Because I'm telling you, I really believe a lot of our health issues is because we may be okay in the physical, because I know some folks that work out like crazy. But you'll be flat on the ground thinking something seriously wrong because you messed up on the inside. So you got to make sure, you got to make sure that that inward man is okay. And, and we got to remember, it's Jesus Christ that makes us innocent. Nothing that we say or nothing that we do. In Philippians 2 and 15, it says that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights of the world. So 
This is a nation that we're living in now. You can watch TV and you see what's going on. We are living in this perverse nation, but it's saying, telling us that we have to be blameless. I'm telling you, it's hard to testify and witness to folks when they know that you're doing in and everything. I'm like, it's, 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 it's hard to do. So you have to make sure that you're, you're not just out there just being crazy. Like I said, we're gonna make some mistakes, but people ought to be able to see you and say, you know what, they're different. You know, they, they don't just go along with anything. And I told them, honestly, I, I be messing with the guys all the time. I said, man, when you walk in a place, you're supposed to be making things uncomfortable. I said, if everything's still going on, the party's still loud, everybody's still cussing and everything, I said, you may need to check your witness. I said, because I'm telling you, when they know where you stand, first of all, you ain't finna get invited no more. But, but once you get there, people gonna start acting different. They tone gonna be different. They gonna start probably cuss, but not as much. They probably gonna still drink, but not as much. They gonna cut up, but not as much because they know it's something about you. That, that makes them know, ah, I've been messing with them all the time. And, and, and then people don't like Tim Tebow. I love Tim Tebow. I'm sorry. He, he went to Florida. I'm an Alabama fan. But I told him, Tim Tebow upsets the locker room. I said, the reason why Tim Tebow is not in the league right now, and I'm, I'm not saying he should be a starting quarterback, but there's plenty of quarterbacks on benches that not better than Tim Tebow. But Tim Tebow has a witness, and he let everybody know how he feels about Jesus Christ. And I guarantee you, they do not want that in the locker room. They want to be able to play their music, say whatever they say, do whatever they do, and it'd be no problem. And I guarantee you, Tim Tebow in that locker room upset things. And we, when we come into a situation, we should upset things. We should, they, people should be like, oh, there they come. I don't know, call me a holy roller. I'm looking for that one. Please, give me that one. Give me that one. Because I'm telling you, when you're like that, God is being pleased. God is pleased. He's pleased with you. So we have to know that, listen, I don't have to prove nothing to you. I'm innocent through the blood of Christ. So we don't have to waste our time to try and to prove our innocence. We are all lawyered up. We have an advocate, Jesus Christ. That case has been dismissed a long time ago. The proof of the Holy Spirit is in our DNA. And I was looking up DNA, and I remember DNA from biology, Miss Nelson class, Phillips High School, 1980. Deoxyribonucleic acid. Don't ask me no more about that. Just, I can remember that part. But DNA is a heredit hereditary material in human and almost all other organisms. What is amazing about DNA is that there are four chemical basis that makes up the DNA code. But a human DNA consists of three million bases. And more than 99% of those bases are the same in all of us. But the order and the sequence of those bases what makes us different. So Jesus Christ is in our DNA. It is part of who we are. He's in us. Jesus says even the spirit of truth will be in you. As Christians, as Christian, the truth is part of what makes us unique. In John, the 14th chapter, verse 17, Jesus is speaking also of what has been placed in you. It says, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you. This spirit is only found in those who have truly given their life to Christ. The world will not accept or cannot, ca cannot understand Jesus Christ, but he's in us. So if the world have any hope of coming to know Jesus Christ, we should be the example that they can look at because he's in us. It's part of who we are. He's part of our DNA. We can't deny him no matter what we want to do. Denying Jesus Christ is simply making yourself sick. Denying the presence of Jesus Christ in you will make you sick. So why say, you know what? Why not say, you know what? This is who I am. This is part of who I, I am. You know, persecution going to come. Like he was telling the disciples, listen, this is going to happen. 
The world hated me, they're gonna hate you. The world's gonna hate you. That's what's supposed to happen. You know, after the Beatitudes, Jesus tells us, persecution is part of who you are. They judge me and they're gonna judge you. So why is it such a big surprise that people are judging you? Why is it such a big surprise that people are persecuting you? Yeah, it hurts. Yeah, it hurts. But what God is saying do, regardless, depending on me. Jesus did not leave him comforted. Jesus was telling them things that were going to keep him encouraged. He said, remember, you know, I'm your friend when you're dealing with this situation. Remember, I abide in you and you and me when you're going through your struggles. Remember, I'm the true vine. Don't pay no attention to what them folks saying. He's saying that, listen, let's trust me. So when you look at chapter 14 and 15, I'm telling you, it's just loaded with scripture that encourages you to keep you going when you are facing whatever you may face. It's just letting you know that Jesus is there with you. You're not alone. So don't live your life as if you got to do this thing on your own. You got to say, you know what? Oh, I got Christ in me. And I guarantee you, the more you do it, the easier it becomes. The less you do it, the more you're going to struggle. We're getting older and older. It should be easier and easier for us to do. Amen. We have the proof of the truth. And the proof is that it proceeded from the Father. He testified of me. So, the truth is coming from God. The truth is coming from God. It's not coming from the Holy Spirit. It's coming from God. The Holy Spirit is just telling us what God has told him. We have to remember that God is all truth. God is all good. It's no evil, no nothing in God. So why not follow him? The truth is proceeding from him. So that is what we need to be going toward. That's what we need to be depending on, his truth, not our truth. Like I said, you can do things in your own might, and I've learned it might seem like they are right, but if it's not lining up with God's word, it's going to be a problem. It's going to be, it's going to be a serious problem. But what that scripture tells me also, it tells me that, you know, I've been sealed. God marked us when we gave our life to him. We're marked. And I'm telling you, you can deny it. You can act like you haven't been marked. You can act like you ain't been sealed to the day of redemption. All it's going to do is have you suffering. It's, it's going to have you struggling. So I understand that I'm marked. So that means that I can't just do whatever I want to do. I got to do those things that are pleasing to God. And when I do those things that are pleasing to God, guess what? Everything around me is going to be kind of okay. We got to be careful. We're responsible for each other. Um, yeah, it's a pitcher named Dave Boswell. He's a, he's a former teammate of Reggie Jackson. He tells a story of how when Reggie Jackson was with the Baltimore Orioles, Earl Weaver, the manager, had a rule that you did not steal a base unless I gave you the signal. And Reggie Jackson didn't like this because Reggie felt, you know what, I know pitchers and catchers well enough to steal a base. So the next chance he got, Reggie was on first base, he took off a second, stole, stole second base with no problem, stood up, brushed himself off, looked over at the manager and said, you know what, that vindicated me. I told you I could steal a base. Later on, Earl Weaver pulled Reggie Jackson to the side and he said, this is the reason why I didn't want you to steal that base. He said, because once you stole second base, first base was open. Our next stronger hitter, which was Lee Mays, automatically got walked because you left first base open. So that took the bat out of his hand. And then furthermore, the next guy up after Lee May, guess what? He wasn't strong against that pitcher. So now Earl Weaver got to go to his bench and get a pinch hitter. And that wind up weakening his bench for later on in the game when he really needed it. See, Reggie Jackson only saw his own personal. And Earl Weaver saw the whole picture. And that's exactly what we do when we decide that we're going to do things on our own. We only take into account how it's going to affect us instead of how it's going to affect everybody else. Because if we really thought about how it's going to affect everybody and everything around us, we would have less murder. We would have less stealing, fighting, divorce and anything else that takes just you into account. 
So that's what God, when we deal in the spirit of the truth, if we, if we do things that God tells us to do, guess what happens? He takes in the, all, that, all that into consideration. It, that's why we don't know the whole story. We don't know. We was talking, um, I was talking um, yesterday about the uh, situation, situation in um, Ferguson. And, and I said, man, I said, everybody involved, they didn't know what, what that could have caused from the time the guy left the store. I said, it started off with one bad decision, it ripple to another bad decision, and it started involving all these people. And if just the first person would have did what he's supposed to do right, none of the rest of it probably would have ever happened. But that's what happens when we don't take in consideration that guess what, what I say and do affect everybody. Uh, my brother Dale was talking to a guy at the shop and, and, and Dale was telling him about a story where he had, um, he had, a, he had a guy that he stayed in the neighborhood with that were outside smoking with his friends and he had his newborn son in his hand with him. And, and Dale said, I started to say something to him right then, but then I said, no, nah, I'm gonna wait till he's by himself because he got his boys around him. You know, I want to feel embarrassed in that. So another guy that was in the shop, and he kind of like dogmatic, he said, no, nah, you should have said something to him right then. He ain't got no business with it. <laughs> smoking around that child. Dale said, yeah, but you know, that problem wasn't the right time. It was around his friend. And, and he, said, he said, you should have said something then. I said, I said, what if he would have said something then? He said, hey, hey, uh, that ain't none of your business. Mind your own business. The guy that was saying that Dale should have said something got infuriated. He said, oh, oh. I would have went off on him. I said, so you going to went off on him? I said, what if he would have went back off on you? He said, oh, you know me, I'm ready. I said, so you going to kill him? I said, you ready to kill him? Oh, he was ready. He said, oh, whatever you want to do. I said, oh, so you going to kill him? Now, the whole purpose was that his son be okay. I said, you don't forget all that because you don't say you don't got all personally involved, and now you're going to kill him. You done, took, <laughs> you done took his son's father away from him. I said, you don't you don't took the man hub, uh, wife husband away from her. I said, that's what happens when we deal in anger. We don't take in consideration everything that is around us. But God's word, God's spirit takes in consideration how what I say may affect you or the next person. And when we deal in that spirit, I guarantee you, we less likely to do those things that are gonna wind up harming someone else. We as Christians should be sensitive to the move of the spirit. We have to remember we are all up, lawyered up. We don't want to allow our selfishness to guide our decision making. That's not our position. It belongs to God. We are just key witnesses for the defense of the gospel. Jesus knows the disciples will, will be the ones who must carry on the word. We should be honored to witness that Jesus hung, bled, and died on the cross for our sin and rose with all power and glory in, a, in his hand. And I was talking, <clears throat> I was thinking about that because Pastor had said something to me who was on the phone the other day. And it's about the gospel. And I said, how many times have you actually witnessed the gospel? How many times have you told someone that Jesus died for your sin? That, but, but he didn't stay dead, that he rose the third day morning with all power and glory. In his hand. How many times have you actually said that to somebody? Until you say that, guess what? You, you really hadn't witnessed the gospel. You really hadn't witnessed the gospel. So we have to be careful that, guess what? Now, now, now like we said, we, we say, we believe we say, we believe that we're going to heaven. But is it about Christ? We are just witnesses for Jesus Christ. We have to go out. We have to let someone know that Jesus Christ is the one. He's the answer to any problem that you may face and not get so much caught up in just us worrying about what we gonna get. Because what I've learned, I've done had big houses, night cars, the whole nine. That is not enough. That is not enough. You gotta be able to do what you need to do as far as your, your responsibilities to Jesus. So I've learned that, you know what? I have to defend the gospel daily. And that's not always quoting scripture, but it's what's saying what's right, doing what's right, doing those ple things that are pleasing to God. It says, in Warren's Wordsby book, 
on, called J is for Jesus, part one, he uses a quote from the theologian James Denny. He says, no man can bear witness of Christ and to himself at the same time. And I started thinking like, wow, wow, I can't witness Jesus Christ and myself at the same time. And I've learned that when you witness Jesus Christ, when folks don't seem as if they get it, it still don't get you discouraged. I told him, you got to be careful. You'll start off witnessing witness Jesus Christ, and then somebody say something or look a certain way, and you get mad. And I guarantee you, the witnessing is no longer on Jesus Christ. It's on yourself. I'm mad. You won't listen to me. You need to listen to me. I'm right. You wrong. And when we get to that, Jesus is not in it. The Holy Spirit has fled the situation. You finna fight on your own, and you're going to get whooped. You're going to get whooped because it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be you and him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Now, what you do is say what Jesus Christ said. And this morning in the Sunday school, and yeah, you weren't here, but, <laughs> but Reverend Johnson, and we was talking about, you know, in the lesson today, and it's talking about how, how Peter witnessed with what God had showed him in these visions, these three visions. And it was the same thing, and Peter was struggling with it. But he went ahead and did what, God told him to do. And then once he did and he explained to his brethren what was going on, the Holy Spirit touched them to go ahead and do what's right. That's what we have to do. We have to say things that allow the Holy Spirit to touch a person. Not always, I'm telling you, people can know you right. And that, and that devil in them wants you to act up. They want you to look crazy because when you look crazy, you, you, you know, you can tell folks they're stupid without saying it, right? Once you say that, guess what? That devil in them be like, who they think they looking at like that? It gets away from what needs to be said and now made, you've made it personal. But what God is saying is, no, just say what I tell you to say and I'm going to touch them. I'm going to be the one that make them move. I'm going to be the one that convict them to do what's right. So once we start doing that more and more, I guarantee you, we're going to be witnessing Christ more. We're going to be more effective in that witness, and I guarantee you, we're going to have less problems. We are corroborate, corroborating witnesses. Jesus says in verse 27, and ye shall bear witness. Jesus came to bear witness of the Father. This angered some and frightened others. He spoke in a way that they had never heard with power and authority. He wants us to testify with that same power and authority. To, co to, to corroborate, it means to confirm and reinforce, and reinforce testimony of another. So we are here to reinforce. We are here not to make up our own truth, but just to speak the truth given to us by Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit didn't reveal his own truth. He revealed to us what Jesus Christ had already told us. He, he had already told the disciples what was going to happen, what they were going to deal with. And the Holy Spirit comes and he reminds us. That's why I do not understand why in the world you won't come to Sunday school. You won't bring your children. I was talking to a guy yesterday, I invited him in the day. I don't know if he came or not, but I invited him. He was just telling me how, you know, how, how, you know, how he, you know, he's touching, he's, trying to teach his son, and I said, man, yeah, do that, do that, do that. I said, but if you can, I said, man, get him in Sunday school because I guarantee you this world is going to blindside them if they are not prepared. And you might not think that those stories about Moses, Noah, and Joseph is going to help them, but I guarantee you, and if you really look at it and really think about it, how many times did something that was taught to you some years ago in, in the church have come to bless you now? But if that has not been placed into that child, I guarantee you this world will have something that will send him for a loop. So we have to say, you know what? We have to get our children educated in this word. They have to hear this word. So don't be lazy about it like the pastor said. You're going to get up and you're going to make it to work on time. Yeah. You're going to make it to that movie on time. You're going to make it to that football, on, football game on time. And if it's at home, you're going to be at home early enough to catch it at the beginning. So why not give your children an opportunity 
to get this word of God and don't be lazy with it. And don't act as if it's a bother for you to come to do it. I'm talking about be happy about it. Be excited about it. Show them that this is something that you're going to need because I guarantee you in this world, they are going to need Jesus Christ. And every opportunity that these doors are open, you should be here learning yourself because this is ever changing. This world is changing and it's crazy. And I guarantee you, it has not been a Bible study I've been to that I didn't receive something that I needed. It hadn't been a Sunday school class with a lesson taught that didn't give me something that I needed. So I know dealing with these things that's going, these things that's going on in this world and in your life, you need this word. So don't take it for granted because I guarantee you, no doubt, I have no doubt, especially your children, they're definitely going to need it. Amen. Paul states in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verse 4 through 6, I thank God always on your behalf for the grace of God which, which was given you by Jesus, that in everything ye are encouraged, enriched by him, in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. See, there was a problem going on in the church of Corinth. You know, some people that came in and they wanted to change the doctrine. Now, Paul is now, in, he's in jail in, in, in Rome. And, but he's getting messy, he's getting worried back, back what's going on in the Corinthian church. And, and Paul needs to address the issue because now it's come up and they're questioning if Paul was even an apostle. Or even if, if the words that he was saying was anything. Or, or they was questioning Paul's character. They were questioning his ministry. So I noticed that Paul didn't focus on them questioning him. What Paul did was start talking about what Jesus Christ had put, put in them, what they had in them, what he had taught them. And he's saying that it didn't come from me. Those utterance came from the Holy Spirit. He let that word convict them to make that change. He didn't take it personal because guess what? It wasn't personal. That was a direct shot at Jesus Christ. That was a direct shot at the word. They did not want to hear the truth. They wanted to fight the truth. So Paul knew that. Paul didn't say, Paul didn't say man, all I came in there and did for y'all, did that and another, yada, yada, yada. Paul didn't say that. Paul reminded them what that Holy Spirit had done for them and told them to focus on that. Because I'm telling you, if you don't focus on, on Christ, I guarantee you, you're going to lose your sight. We are eyewitnesses to the testimony, the disciples' testimony. The disciples walked right alongside Jesus. They could give an eyewitness account of the miracles he had performed, the parables he had spoke, and the power he possessed. They knew him better than anyone. Jesus explained why he expected more from his disciples. In verse 27, in verse 27 it says, in my text it says, because ye have been with me from the beginning. They had been with Jesus from the, begin, from the beginning of his ministry. They could give eyewitness testimony. And it used to amaze me how, how could you walk with Jesus and talk with Jesus all these years and still have so many doubts? So many doubts. And you know what? And, and you got to be careful because I started saying, the, I was like, man, the disciples must have been crazy. How could you, all these miracles he performed and this and that. And then I realized, man, that's not enough. That indwelling and that Holy Spirit had to come. He had to go to be with the Father. That the Holy Spirit had to come to help them deal with this flesh because we're still in this flesh and this flesh is full of doubt. I've learned that, you know what, Gary, stop trying to figure it out because like I'm, I'm a figuring out type of person. I'm telling you, I'd have figured out the Rubik's Cube. I know how to do it. I'll figure it out. If it's a puzzle or something, I'll figure it out. But when it comes to this, it ain't no figuring out. It's being obedient. This word don't make sense. In the, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, natural, it don't make sense to turn the other cheek. It makes sense to turn his cheek after he done turned yours. But in this, in the, it's telling us that, listen, it's not about that. It's about the spirit. It's about God's will. He's got a plan for us that we don't know nothing about. He needs this world to go in the direction that he needs, not us. So we got to say, you know what? I got to be an eyewitness too. Now, how can I be an eyewitness and I wasn't there? I am a witness to what he's done in my life. I know the past that I went down. I know the things that I've had to deal with. I know how he's been there for me when I'm going through my problem. 
So why I can't testify of that? It's nothing worse than knowing the answer to a person's problem or having an idea of what they may be dealing with because you're dealing with the same thing and you don't say nothing. And I'm talking about don't tell them no crazy stuff to do. Tell them what God has done for you to help you get through that situation. I'm talking about be honest with them. Tell them how you felt because guess what? Telling them how you felt going to let them know you know how they feel. Because folks, they, I'm talking about they searching. They searching. They want to know what the answer to the problem is. And I guarantee you, if you tell them what God has done in your life, if you witness what Jesus Christ has done for you, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, they're going to be blessed, and you're going to be blessed also. So it's telling us that we have to continue to witness Jesus Christ. Jesus was brought, brought before Pilate to answer his question that there, had, there was no answer that would satisfy him. So Jesus didn't say a word. What Jesus was here on earth could never be understand by this world. The kingdom that he spoke of was spiritual, not physical. So as they took him from place to place, judging him, nothing they could say or do could stop what was about to happen. His life had been all the testimony he needed. His earthly duties were fulfilled. The Holy Spirit would soon come and dwell in the hearts of man. Jesus was going home to be at the right side of his father. His death served as death to sin. And to believers, it was the resurrection of eternal life. He did not die for his own sin, for he never knew sin. That's why Paul tells us in, 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 in Romans 6, and, and it's one of my favorites. It's a, I know the whole, whole uh, chapter. It, it, it tells me, he asked a rhetorical question. He said, what shall we say? Well, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. And like Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death have no more dominion over him, for in that he died, he died unto sin once. And in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. So likewise, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto Jesus Christ, our Lord. The only way that you can enjoy this freedom, the only way that you can be planted together with Christ is to give your life to Christ. Right here, right now, we offer Christ to you. Don't wait another minute. Don't, don't, don't think that you can handle this on your own. Understand that, listen, I have someone that will help me in this world because when you think that you can handle this world by yourself, I guarantee you, you're going to find yourself by yourself. But when you know that there's someone that's there that can be right there with you, dealing with all that you have to deal with, it makes things a whole lot easier. See, there's a void right now. You're on one side and Christ is on the other side. And you must bridge that gap. And the only way you're going to bridge that gap is you give your life to him. So right here, right now, don't wait another minute. Give your life to Christ today. He's waiting for you. Don't think that you can handle this on your own. Don't give this world another opportunity to beat you. Because what I'm telling you is if you don't have Jesus Christ, you don't have anything. And when you have Christ, you've got it all. So always remember when dealing with anything that you may deal with, and guess what? I have Christ in me. I'm all lawyered up. No matter what's going on, I know I'm going to be all right. But those who haven't given their life to Christ, I ask right now that you come forth, that you give your life to Christ right here, right now. We offer Christ to you.
Christ to you. church say amen. amen. Come on, say it like you mean it. Amen. All lawyered up. I never heard that terminology before, but it makes sense. Did not our hearts burn as God spoke to us through the man of God? Amen. Great message, great message. Now it's time that we give of our tithes and offerings. God has given us this great moment to come before him to, to give him what he's given to us, not to own, but to take care of, to, to be caretakers of it. The Bible says that if we bring it unto the Lord, the Bible says that he'll open up the windows of heaven 
and he'll pour you out a blessing that you won't have room to receive. We are living witness that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The Bible says on your envelope, you'll see some things that are going on. And then Malachi, the third chapter, talks about what we just spoke. Luke, the sixth chapter, verse 38 says, Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure. Pressed down and shaken together. And running over shall men give into your bosoms. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Now, all I say to you that if you trust God with your salvation, then you ought to trust him with your whole being. And whatever God has given you, not what other folks give, but what God has given you. The Bible says you have freely to receive. Now prepare now to freely give. Will you stand on your feet? We ask God's blessings upon our time. Father, we give you praise now and we thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for your manservant who preached so richly the truths of your word. Thank you, God, now, Lord, for the privileged time that you give us to come now, Lord, as we come. We give of our resources, God, that we have, you have prospered us with. Freely we receive it now, freely we give unto you, O oh God. We ask now, Lord, your blessings upon these tithes and offerings, that you multiply them and that you will use them in whatever way you desire. To that end, Lord, we always will give your name the praise. For we do ask it in Jesus' name we pray. Say amen. Come on, say amen. Say amen. Now sing with me. With a loud voice, sing amen, amen. seated we're still in worship for we worship him with our tithes and offering no brother preachers and brother deacons will you bring ye the tithe